Danny Burswell is the executive director for Big Sky Resort Area District. He has a BA in, uh, he has BAs in management and computer information systems from App State, East Coast, and a master's in management from Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Danny moved to Montana in 2007 and spent more than a decade with a nonprofit Yellowstone Association before starting with the Big Sky Resort Area District in 2019. Uh, Danny, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Joe. Thanks for pulling yeah. this panel together, too. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, we appreciate you jumping in. Um, you're a hunter. You're an outdoorsman. Uh, what do the words responsible growth mean to you? Yeah, you know, I think it, uh, in many ways, it can be embodied in this quote from one of my favorite quotes from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Hmm. Here's your country. Cherish these natural wonders, cherish the natural resources, cherish the history and romance as a sacred heritage for your children and your children's children. And this last sentence is interesting. Do not let selfish men or greedy interests skin your country of its beauty, its riches, or its romance. So wow. when I think about that quote and um, the context of this conversation, I really believe that responsible growth involves a high level of collaboration, a high level of partnership, and transparency uh, amongst uh, both private and public interests within, um, you know, communities. So, what what I mean by that is, you know, when our board and and when the resort area district is making decisions, they're not easy decisions. And I had a a wise man once tell me that um, back when I was in fundraising in, in Yellowstone National Park that you know it's really difficult. Um, for donors when you're comparing a decision between trying to fund cancer research or trying to fund world heritage, I mean, uh, world hunger and trying to fund conservation. So it's a, it is a difficult decision when it, when it does come right down to it. And I think what, um, what at the end of the day, responsible growth means is making strategic decisions with, uh, in our case, you know, how we use those dollars. So that's, that's an area that we've really been focused on here with the resort area district in terms of um, taking in our public funded tax collections and how we use those dollars to, to fund initiatives that are gonna support the future of, of our community. Yeah, ab absolutely. No, that was a really fantastic answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, even got Roosevelt in there. Uh, okay. tell, us, tell us a little more about um, about Big Sky Resort Area Disc, about BizRad, you know, how it works and, and your role. Yeah, so we've been around since 1992. We actually started as a, um, a resort area and didn't have a, an official district formation until 1998 when we brought on the ability to be able to um, make decisions locally with a locally elected board of, of five individuals that uh, volunteer countless hours and I can't say a, a huge enough shout out and thanks to the volunteer boards within um, all of Big Sky and, and the districts. Um, you know, we, we collect funds in its most simple state, uh, governed by Montana Code Annotated. We are a taxing district that collects funds and then in turn um, takes those funds and, and makes investments uh, with those funds for our community. And we've been doing it since 1992. And it's really interesting if you actually take a look at and I was looking at some of this data to prepare for our conversation today, but if you, you take a look at the history of the resort area district and, and by breaking those um, numbers into a, a couple of categories, it's interesting to see how some of the um, shifts based upon what community needs exist uh, have happened over the years. And um, yeah, it's a tough decision for our board on an annual basis to determine how they're going to allocate those dollars, but we're working towards actually doing that in a more intentful way. Uh, my role within the organization, I came on a little over a year ago to support uh, the fairly rapid growth that was happening with the resort area district and, and help to guide decision-making for the board. Um, one of the things that we've implemented most recently, well, there's two things that we've implemented at a strategic level recently. We funded the Our Big Sky uh, Community Vision and Strategy Plan, which you can find on our website. Um, many of you participated in, in that plan within our community and we're using that as a, a tool for decision making. Um, and leveraging that plan, we actually launched our, our first ever uh, strategic plan for the Big Sky Resort Area District. And 
really focusing on one, uh, strategic investments. And that involves, uh, you know, really making um, the best use of our funds, uh, both in the short term and in the long term. Engaging our community, you know, I, I think one of the things that, um, if you go back to that Roosevelt quote that, that people have the ability to do is simply understand what exists within their community to help guide decision making of local leaders um, and, and help make decisions for your, your future of your community. Uh, so engaging our community is our responsibility from, um, from a governmental perspective. We are a local government in addition to a lot of the other districts that exist within our community. And then lastly, um, you know, really focusing on for, for this upcoming year, a culture of excellence. You know, we, we are using tax dollars here that uh, are helping to guide the future of our community. And, you know, in order to have responsible growth, we really need to be leveraging those dollars as, as much as possible to respond to the community needs. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about the pandemic. I think all of our worlds changed in, in the spring of this year. And, you know, a lot of uncertainty existed at that time. And, and we made a decision at that point in time to, to break what had typically been an annual allocation into two cycles, a spring cycle and a, a fall cycle. And that's been a tremendous lift both for the district, our board, but also the applicants as well. And um, what we were able to do is be able to uh, take some of that uncertainty and, and cross our fingers and, and hope for the best as we engaged into the summer season, which we have found uh, both May and June collections have, have exceeded our expectations significantly. And we've been very happy about that. You know, yeah. July has been a little bit of a mixed bag uh, in terms of uh, small or large group gatherings, conferences, um, weddings, things of that nature, not happening in the Big Sky community. But, you know, several of our panelists tonight have, have touched on this with the recreational aspect. Boy, we've sure seen that here in, in Big Sky and, and on our waterways and on our public trails. And um, thankful that we have these uh, wonderful resources, but it's going to be, uh, it's definitely going to be in, um, ongoing and kind of uh, investment that we'll need to, to really consider in terms of recreation and conservation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank, thanks for um, clarifying that. Uh, well, you, you, just, you just talked about BizRad, Big Sky Resort Area District as a governmental entity. Um, you, know, you guys commissioned uh, a plan, that, that plan you referenced, our Big Sky, last year and the community identified a number of needs from affordable housing to you know, conservation, to uh, traffic, to infrastructure. Um, it's a lot to, for anyone to tackle. But you know, I'm curious, uh, has, has the Resort Tax Board discussed the idea of incorporation? It's certainly come up um, within the context of our conversations and it certainly uh, was a, subtle subtext within the our big sky survey results if you take a look at that you know our, our main focus right now is ensuring that um, our organization is doing the best that we can to steward these dollars forward and, and truly leave a legacy on our community you know as far as incorporation goes there's a lot of um, there's a lot of history with that conversation as I'm, I'm sure you well know there's uh, been initiatives in the past that have tried to move that initiative forward um, and, and our board context, we truly believe that, you know, the, the grassroots citizen efforts that um, were able to actually move forward the formation of the district. And by the way, we have Montana Code Annotated, which outlines uh, what our responsibility is, which is, you know, putting it in its most simple form, collecting the dollars and ensuring the highest level of compliance from the, the collections and then making and, and stewarding along strategic investments with those dollars. Sure. You know, you start to scoot outside of that scope and um, you definitely start to, to cross on the fringes of an area that might not necessarily be within our authority. Now that said, I think um, because there is so much history related to the, the concept of incorporation and, and conversations about, you know, the pro pros and cons of, of doing so, 
it's not going to be an easy task or an easy process for, for anyone to really pick that up and, and identify what the pros and cons are, identify what the, the issues are that we're trying to address. Um, you know, if there were a citizen group, I, I think the resort area district board and, and district staff would, would need and certainly want to be engaged in those conversations because at the end of the day, we're the fiduciary arm of the community and um, there would certainly be some, some um, changes that would need to happen in order to actually execute if there were a municipal government to, to come into place. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, I, I, and that's interesting, you know, I mean, you are technically a governmental entity, but you can't necessarily say that you can operate um, outside of certain fiduciary responsibilities, obviously. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated one. It'd be interesting to see if, um, you know, to, to see if a community group does, you know, bring that up or how that even could look, because I know you and I've talked about it in the past that, uh, you know, and even earlier today that I think, you know, we both think that everyone's got, we sort of need to understand where we are before we understand where we're going. And um, when people start running before they tie their shoes, things can get complicated. But um, let me ask you this question, you know, so, all right, put yourself here. It's, it's mid April, 2020. Uh, what are you expecting to happen this summer? So, in order to prepare for that question, we're really talking to um, industry professionals, uh, regional, local uh, businesses. We're talking to uh, ski communities in Colorado. We're talking to the airport to, to see what their predictions are and, and trying to get a handle on this thing. Yeah. Um, we produced a scenario planning uh, document and, and recommendation and examples for the board on a very conservative basis of 50% um, collections of, of what we received in 2019. Um, fast forward to September 14th, and what we've seen, and, and keep in mind our collections are always a month after. So for yeah. instance, you know, July just closed out. We were 7% down in July from, from last year, which was a pleasant surprise for us, predicting a 50% decrease. Mm. Um, you know, we were uh, thrilled to, to see that our collections had actually um, maintained on track relatively. And I think going into this winter season, it's an even bigger question mark for us. And, and what we've done in working with community partners, uh, both businesses, um, as well as, you know, our, um, our local chamber of commerce and, and pulling together uh, an executive summary for our board, which will be delivered prior to the fall allocation process and, and making the best decision possible based on forecasting what this winter is going to, to look like here in, um, in Big Sky. You know, thousands mm -hmm. of skier visits happen on Lone Mountain. And um, what does that mean in terms of COVID-19? How has our community adapted to plan for the pandemic and, and plan for what hopefully will be a, a ski season that stays and keeps our community healthy and, and open and our economics um, viable here in our small community of Big Sky that relies so heavily on that winter season. Yeah. We were surprised by, we were really surprised by what the, uh, the summer brought us in, um, here in Big Sky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what, what winter brings and you know, yeah, Vail Resorts has made some interesting moves and, and we'll see sort of what uh, resort areas and ski areas follow suit um, or make their own path. Uh, you know, this past year was obviously more complicated uh, for the resort um, area district than in years past in terms of, you know, what should be funded through resort tax appropriate money uh, and what money was needed to stay you needed to keep in the coffers for potential use related to COVID-19 issues down the road. I mean, there are hospital um, components and needs there. Uh, you know, three types of appropriation requests were tabled this summer, winter-based projects, uh, research, and conservation. Um, I was just curious if you could talk a little about the thinking behind uh, that decision. Yeah, and, and let me be clear, the the recreation and con conservation aspect of, mm -hmm. of what we fund. Um, if you were to take a look at a, a five year snapshot, you're looking at that approaching a 
approximately $7 million on an, uh, a five-year basis. So it's certainly been a priority for, for the resort area district. Um, mm -hmm. Our decision-making behind our spring allocation process really involved um, you know, delaying what we would consider more long-term types of initiatives. And that would include uh, infrastructure projects, that would include, uh, in our mind, uh, many conservation projects. It would include not uh, committing our funding for an unknown winter season and really focusing on the short term and making sure that we're keeping the lights on, making sure that um, these organizations that we've traditionally funded are, are having as smooth of a transition as possible. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we actually did wind up funding a, a vast majority of all the conservation projects um, that it, it existed there. So, um, you know, the spring thought process, which is probably going to be very similar moving into this fall allocation process was, what do we know with the current state of the union? Um, how can we use that information to be able to make decisions in the short term? that can keep our community viable, can respond to the impacts of COVID-19, and how do we ensure that uh, we're holding on to at least a, a pulse of what those long-term decisions are going to be. So, for example, you know, moving into this fall cycle, it's evident that um, you know, we will have a winter season. I think it'll be a much easier situation to, to have a, a conversation for our board and a, a decision around you know, those winter activities that traditionally have been funded in that spring cycle. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the thought process around, you know, sure. why we had some of these particular segments, if you will, identified for delaying the decision. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's not a, not an easy one. And you sort of, <laughs> you need to, you need to be able to compartmentalize certain things and, and prioritize. So, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of moving parts there and this very strange time. Um, uh, Danny, you know, lastly, uh, let's ask you what we've, we've asked almost everyone else, you know, what does Big Sky and Southwest Montana look like to you in 10 years? Yeah, I've been thinking about this while we've all had this question asked to us. I think Southwest Montana looks like a broad-based community that has a lot of transplants very similar to how I am a transplant and many of you on this panel are transparent transplants that came to a place like Southwest Montana because it was very special. Um, it's a natural environment that is in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is a, a place that we're all very fortunate and, and lucky to live within. Um, I think there's going to be similar to how when we all uh, transplanted to, to Montana, many of us, um, a portion of education and, and creating stewards that will in turn, uh, hopefully try to maintain this place for, uh, as Theodore Roosevelt said, our children, our children's children and our children's children. Great answer, Danny. That was, that was really good. I appreciate, I appreciate your, you taking the time. Uh, and just wanna say thanks to all our panelists really for making the time for sharing your insight with us. It's, uh, it's been enlightening. It's been eye opening for me and hopefully the audience feels the same way. I'm sure they do. Uh, Brandon, uh, any, any final uh, follow up questions or audience questions for, for Danny? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Um, Danny, you were touching on the topic of, of incorporation with Joe. I'm curious, um, what benefits do you believe there would be, you know, if Big Sky were to become incorporated to help guide the anticipated growth? Not sure I'm, I'm qualified at this point to answer that question. I can tell you what it won't fix. And like so many of you, uh, there are some areas out there that are of concern and, you know, traffic from that bridge project that was happening. I sat in that thing for a long period of time. I can tell you this, incorporation will not necessarily fix that. Go to Bozeman and they have plenty of traffic problems. Um, I can also tell you that there's a lot of rumors that are spreading around uh, related to what incorporation does and does not do. And I think a thoughtful um, education of what incorporation means and what it doesn't mean would be of value. So we're all speaking on the same page. More than anything, 
we have current systems in place and we have current local government entities that are focused on certain initiatives. For instance, uh, your water and sewer district through partnership um, on that project that, that Bayard uh, noted was able to work with the resort area district, work with the housing trust to actually have a home run, not only for all of those organizations and for growth, but also for conservation. If you look at that, that project um, in terms of the wastewater treatment plan, it's gonna have a, a much higher quality of uh, treatment of our effluent. And not only that, it started the conversation about how to address the canyons um, wastewater treatment. And, and that's something that we're really proud of. So, you know, I, I do hope that um, as we explore the option, if, if the community uh, finds a small group of grassroots individuals that are interested in exploring what other governmental options exist out there, I think it's important for us to consider where we've had opportunities in the past and that the 1% uh, wastewater treatment plants of prime example of, of how the power of partnership and collaboration can really bring a community together to address multiple needs.